The current members of the Agmar branch of the Golden Tree Adventuring Guild stand in a now empty council chamber in the heart of the tree city of Deepwood. All of you are, I would imagine, still reeling from the sudden surprise battle against the mysterious stranger called the shepherd and all that you experienced and learned there is still a whiff of ozone the sights of smashed glass and furniture you see fading ice patches and puddles of blood feeble but recovering council members and an empty mystical tree that is all that remains of this epic battle. All that remains, save for you all. And the unmoving suit of armor, housing your undead ally, the Fortunate. The Fortunate still has their hand on the shoulders of a pair of you, but they are absolutely covered in vines and vegetation poking out from every nook and crevice in their formerly impenetrable armor. As you hear the oncoming sounds of the reinforcements that seem like they were sent for hours ago, you have a moment to process and a moment to react. Val, turning from where she watched the shepherd leave through the portal they summoned, their words still ringing in her ears of they weren't real has her in disbelief and she turns to confirm what she knows is true in that the fortunate is real but turns to find emptiness and rushes to rushes to them but getting no physical reaction when she comes close and knowing she should feel uncomfortable and that prickle on the back of her neck is missing in desperation to find her friend she casts mind link you're met with nothing Val hugs the fortunate and buries her face. And you can see her shoulders are moving with her tears. Kaskrin moves a little bit closer to the fortunate and to Valeska. And in the same way that everyone has, you know, we've all experienced the aura that the fortunate puts out. And as he gets closer and realizes that he feels fine, that lack causes his stomach to drop. And more than the loss of the aura, the loss of the fortunate presence in this moment hits him really hard. Castrin kind of goes around 
to look at the fortunate in the face, in, you know, through the mask to see past all the plants if there's anything left. He hears Valeska's tears and by his own confirmation realizes the fortune is gone. It takes a moment and Kashkin realizes he's lost another comrade. And they come and go. This life is dangerous. It's rewarding, but it can be devastating like this. And he puts his hand to his chest in a salute and says, May the gods, wherever they are, be kind to this one as they move from this life to the next. Selv will turn around and I'm guessing the, the fortunate's arms are still kind of up where they were on our shoulders. And the first thing I'm going to do is uh, like grab the arm of the fortunate and kind of similar to what Cass had done and just look and see if I can see any movement, anything at all. And then realizing that that uncomfortable aura is gone. I am going to look at the armband that was on the fortunate and see if it is still on there or if it looks like it's like now kind of coming off now that there's no um, no undead presence in the armor. As you guys are observing and taking this in, it is really difficult because other than, of course, the vines, the vegetation, they look totally unchanged. Nothing is different. The fortunate has stood very still many times before. And the only difference is that you're just... There's nothing there. There's no reactions. Nothing. I'll step away slightly and uh, give a deeper than normal bow. And I will say in Draconic. Your oath was heard. I think throughout this whole scene, Checkers has been kind of around the perimeter. And he's been surprisingly quiet this whole time. And anyone looking at him can just kind of see him watching the scene, watching the fortunate in anticipation, almost. And for Checkers, he's thinking that there's there's a joke at the end of this. There's a punchline. After seeing the fortunate stand stock still before, he's thinking there's going to be a moment where they get up, where everything's fine, they shake off the vines, and they hug Val as hard as they can. And he just waits for that. As the people start coming in, as, as the reinforcements show up, he just stands and waits for when the fortunate gets back up. As everyone starts to filter in, Kaskrin will go up to the fortunate and in much the same way that you would close someone's eyes, he will touch them and move their armor back into a like a presentable state. Their arms at their side, their spear in their hand, standing at attention, ready for what comes next. The cacophony hits very suddenly. The doors that you walked through are thrown open, practically kicked off their hinges. You see up front leading dozens of other 
Raven Mounts and others is Juniper. At the same time, two giant ravens fly through either window that had been cracked open earlier in the fight. And you can hear more kind of outside. It is just this huge hit of activity and noise and shouting and battle cries and confusion. And you all see with his goggles kind of pulled up onto his forehead. You can see Juniper's eyes look at you guys. In an instant, Juniper goes from this kind of intense battle grimace of determination and looks around seeing no combatants, seeing only you guys and sensing the mood even kind of amid all of this chaos and you see their eyes widen. He just looks at you guys and you can tell that his heart breaks for you guys. Eventually, battle-ready warriors give way to medics and healers and other leaders who look after you and look over the members of the council who are now kind of up. They are weak, but they are conscious and moving around, but no longer imbued with that same magic that they were kind of when they were presiding. What few witnesses there were to the attack, uh, including the council, Juniper, even uh, Warren and Baltar, the two, uh, the two bards, quickly report the facts to everyone of what happened, leading to kind of a bit of a stunned silence. Eventually, after kind of some debriefing and healing and all that, a raven mount comes up to you and offers to take you guys back to the inn where you had stayed the previous night. So uh, if that's the case, if they're starting to, to lead us away, I will motion towards Cass and then um, kind of gesture towards the fortunate. They need to come back with us. Now has not left her embrace of the fortunate, but will knowing it's time to to leave the council chambers, she will take a few deep breaths to steal herself and ask the Raven Mount to bring a stretcher. With looks to Selvin Cass kind of communicate that we need to move and move them with us. She'll kind of make sure that's happening. But then just look to make eye contact with Checkers. I think Checkers looks back at you, Val, with a set of complicated emotions in his eyes. And you, with your incredibly high passive insight, (laughs) it feels like you're just reading his thoughts right off of him. There's this confusion, there's this resignation, but there's also this underlying almost determination that is kind of building inside Checkers right now. And he just looks at you and gives you the smallest nod and turns to go help the others. You guys are escorted back to the tavern. It is unchanged and relatively empty. The bartender who was there uh, the night before and this morning uh, is nowhere to be found, but Warren and Baltar, the two tattooed storytellers are sitting there kind of with a thousand yard stare when you guys kind of come up and when the door opens they kind of look snap over to you and kind of just both stand up as you guys are all walking in neither say anything as you come in as they see the fortunate come in 
but they just take you guys in and say as much as they can without words. You guys can certainly leave, you know, put the the fortunate up in a room and you all find yourselves back in a comfortable place where you had shared meals not long ago. It is a little emptier. There were two additional individuals here this morning when you left. Two fewer now. Kaskrin finds himself sitting at a table, maybe not necessarily knowing exactly how he got here (laughs) over the past few hours. With the loss of the fortunate fresh in his mind, but also just the events of the past few hours, of the past few days, all competing for space, all trying to be made sense of. And unconsciously, he just blurts out, what have we gotten ourselves into? Just even yesterday, I was trying to find a warm bed. That was all I was worried about. And now we've got a former Gilder trying to, what, fight the Ultra Giants? Trying to fight the gods? And he was just toying with us. We're lucky we didn't all end up the same way. And his hands are just bunched up in fists at the powerlessness that he feels. I think Dal is just nodding her head as Cass is talking and will reach out a hand to place on his shaking fist and say, you're right. We all could have died. We didn't. Most likely because the shepherd didn't think we were enough of a threat. And let us see what they're planning. Why they're planning it. But that's what we use. Not today. I can't. I can't today. But we do a little bit each day. Because... We have to. And Kaskrin will take your hand in a friendly, reassuring grip. That's right. Just one step in front of the next. Self will go to the, um, basically to the bar and just kind of of look look, look behind it and just uh, grabs a, a deck of cards from behind there. And just uh, brings it out to the table and just uh, takes him out and begins shuffling. And then doesn't say anything to any of the others and just starts dealing. I'm debating if Val goes and gets um, Mal's wart just to make her feel worse. (laughs) Because feeling worse might make her feel better. Kaskrin definitely will. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And Kaskrin will take the cards almost automatically after a week now of having played games every night with the fortunate and you know he lets out a little chuckle he sees what's going on takes a look at his hand sets it back down and he'll go to the bar too and kind of start fixing everyone up something to drink he comes back with a couple of cocktails a couple of ales But more importantly, he comes back with four shot glasses and a full bottle of Mal's Ward (laughs) that he found dusty, stuffed away in a cabinet. Next to the bottle with the poison. Yeah, Yeah, right. (laughs) Next to the cleaning supplies. I I found this leveling out the bar. (laughs) And then the the bar is like tilted to the woods. And he pours everyone a shot. And with the cards on the table... He kind of looks at everyone and just says, to the fortunate. To the fortunate. 
To the Sorry. fortunate. To the fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, Steve also toasted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As Checkers is holding his shot up, <laughs> he looks at it, and he looks at all of you sitting around the table. You know, we didn't know the fortunate very long. As far as I know, the fortunate's only been around, like, a couple years, maybe? Because they, like, regained... They would be young. They would yeah. probably be, like, Mac. I don't remember the exact timeline, but, like... They regained sentience yeah. like a few years ago. Yeah, when when Agmar got resettled, which uh -huh. I think was, I don't remember exactly, but yeah, like the oldest the fortune would be like would be like maybe Val's age. When you think about it, the fortunate wasn't really that much older than any of us are. Cass is like fucking middle aged. <laughs> Cass He's an just old man. sits quietly, <laughs> yeah. sipping yeah. his yeah. smells of white drink. Yes, we're all not very we're all Teenagers, we're all teenagers or in our early to mid twenties. Yes. What's <laughs> up, my fellow youths? Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's the prime adventuring age, right? Yeah. You, you start when you're young, and you just you go from there. It's between going. two ignore, and fifty-five. Right. Yeah. Ignore the ever-growing, brilliant white beard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. How do you like the current musical stylings? Yes. <laughs> and Checkers is, is happy. You got to chuckle out of that one. But <laughs> um, I was thinking. They didn't really get that long of a life. When you think about it, they were going to live forever. And just by chance, that all ended today. I wish we could have done more to help them live the life they wanted to live. And Checkers just drinks his <laughs> shot. <laughs> and, and, you see then, him and, then, and then immediately passes out. <laughs> yeah. You see him slowly turn purple. <laughs> <laughs> there is one other thing I would like to do. At some point, kind of while we're playing cards, I am going to motion for both Warren and Baltar to come to the table. I'm going to deal them in. And then um, I'm going to say... Let me tell you a story of how the fortunate got their name. After a night of reflection and remembering and feeling, I imagine some of you are just out, just hit by exhaustion. I imagine others uh, might have had trouble going to sleep. But... As it always does, the next day comes. It is a gloomy, rainy day. Any who come down in the morning see there is already food set out, but again, no bartender immediately apparent. You would kind of similarly see Warren and Baltar, who are also kind of already there and up, looking probably slightly hungover as they have had yet to experience Mal's Wart and all their travels. And we'll say not waiting for you guys, but kind of relatively after you guys are all up and have gathered or shown yourselves, you hear a knock on the door. There's kind of an awkward moment, I would imagine, where everyone just is like, wait, are we supposed to... Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a public it's inn. Not are we supposed place? to open the door? Uh, the door opens. And... The head of an old tiefling man pokes through the door. They are wearing, you immediately recognize as the same robes as the Council of Elders was wearing yesterday. And you can see they have these big kind of pointed horns and this very wrinkly but still very alert, intense face. And they kind of poke their head in and you see wisps of gray hair kind of coming between these horns and combing all the way back in kind of a short little hairstyle. As they kind of step in and kind of look around the room solemnly, you see behind them is Juniper, the halfling raven mount. Kaskrin will stand up from the table that he was sitting at and go to be respectful 
and greet the council member, just in a, a short nod of respect. The elderly man kind of looks around and takes your, you know, kind of like looks at you again respectfully back and, and looks at all of you. And they say, um, hello. We did not get a formal introduction yesterday for many reasons, but my name is uh, Filigrin Pines. I am, well, I'm a member of the Deepwood Council of Elders. I am uh, here first and foremost to thank you all for your bravery, your assistance, your, uh, your heroism, protecting us and protecting one of our city's uh, great secrets and treasures. There is uh, also no amount of sorrow that we can properly share knowing what you had lost as well, of course. Thank you, council member. Your words are kind. None can be kind enough, I am afraid. Do you mind if I sit? I uh, oh, perhaps please, please come, come sit. foolishly walked all the way here. I'll uh, pull out a chair. Oh, thank you. And they kind of like slowly just like squat and kind of like fall into the chair a little bit and let out a big sigh. I'll actually, I'll put a small plate of maybe some fruit and a little <laughs> bit, uh, you know, in front of them. And then uh, like a, a nice oh, warm, thank, uh, like, thank a, you. like a cup of tea or something. Oh, wow. I, well, uh, well, goodness, I already ate, but I mean, and then like reaches out at least for the tea and takes a tiny sip. And just kind of holds it in their in their hands. It is good to, that you're here. We meant to talk to you yesterday to address the council, and we never quite got a chance to do that. Yes. Uh, well, uh, I think yesterday uh, was a different council than the one today. In terms of Attitude. We're all still kicking, of course. <laughs> uh, sorry, and like realizes he said a joke for some <laughs> reason, and he looks and he says, "Oh yes, we will get to the the council business, of course." I had truthfully hoped you would speak to me on that matter again of what I know you came to to talk about. But first, and he like gestures at Juniper, who's just kind of been like lurking in the background a little bit. I, uh, I was wondering if you would help me with something. Juniper, like, slinks up, just super sheepish, and, like, trying to be as small as possible, which is pretty effective as a halfling. I'm just going to kind of look between the council member and Juniper and just kind of back and forth, and, uh, I'm getting the impression that this is something that, uh, Juniper may or may not feel guilty about. Is that... Uh, would you like to roll an insight check? Oh, I would love roll, to. Roll a, roll a d20 in this game of Dungeons & Dragons. You know, oh yeah, dice. We use those, don't we? Uh, okay. Ten total. He is being so... There's so much going on that, like, maybe there's guilt, but, like, it could be any number of, of feelings. And Filigrin is like, oh, um, I believe uh, you all know young Juniper. Uh, he is one of our youngest, but most enthusiastic Raven Mounts. He is the best Raven Mount we have ever met. And the Filigrin like turns to Juniper and just like, kind of just gestures itself. You're like, oh, see? Well, uh, Juniper is, uh, he is a a strange case of Raven Mounts. You see, uh, he came to me this morning and, uh, he said that, um, it was letting in people from the outside that had caused all of this and that maybe we should continue to keep our 
elevators closed, so to speak, to the outside world. And, oh, well, that has long been the tradition, of course. Uh, but uh, I find myself unsure this morning. And so I wondered if we could get your thoughts on the matter. And you see Juniper is, like, beat red. And now that he's closer, you can see has, like, red circles around their eyes and, like, are bloodshot and are not looking at any of you. Philogran's just, uh, it's just, it's very difficult to see such a youth of vim and vigor to uh, be so closed-minded, don't you think? And now, a word from our sponsors. Hey there, it's Jonathan here with The Midroll. Did you know that one of the easiest ways to support the shows you love is to give them a rating? That's right. Rating and reviewing your favorite shows gives others the chance to learn about them, and maybe find their new favorite show too. If you want to support us directly, you can check out our Kofi, where we have our How to Promo document. It's a pay-what-you-want resource that gives you the basics of getting your tabletop role-playing product out in front of others. Also, we have merch! Check out our website at recklessattack.com for links to all of our merchandise and links to all of the artists that we partner with. That's all from me. Thanks again, and hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. If you are asking for my opinion on this, I think it would have been worse if you did not allow outsiders in. Not that we did everything overly special, but I think the outcome would have been worse if we were not there. Filigrin just kind of is nodding along. I, I agree. I agree. I think... You tried to shut out the outside world, and it still found you. And unless you want Deepwood to become a tomb, you can't shut yourself off. You can't shut this place off to those who would bring life and happiness back. Yesterday was a horrible day. None of us will forget what happened. But I think we all take our experience and grow from it. We need to be there for each other. And we may trust the wrong people, but we can't stop trying to trust. And I think yesterday Juniper had the right idea. Helping us enter the city and helping us seek an audience with you and the rest of the council. Oh, Juniper helped you come in, did he? And like, Filigrin like very largely and broadly, like, turns to Juniper. Oh, so you were the one who brought the outsiders in, were you? Mm, very interesting and new information. Can Val do an inside check on Juniper? Because didn't Juniper tell us they wanted the city open? You know that they did. Yeah. That was like, Juniper was the one who's like, no one else wants to open the city up, or at least it doesn't feel like it. And like, we have to. So for Filigrin to come in saying that Juniper's like... Well, Juniper's went, playing some reverse psychology on the council member and or, I'm here for it. Or Juniper changed their mind and said, he's like, you know what? Maybe if this is what happens when things, when people do come in, maybe we should just shut the whole thing down. But Catherine will, will continue... Um, and Juniper is the reason that 
you know, that we were here able to help. We know that something is happening here in the city. We, and he kind of gestures towards both of them. We know it, it's not necessarily safe here. And that you have run away from this problem by closing your doors to the outside. I won't say whether that was the right or wrong choice, obviously. I could not presume to make that decision. But maybe it's time for a change. Maybe it's time to bring things back a little closer to the way things were. Let me lean on my old age and ask an inappropriate question. Knowing what you know, knowing what had happened and knowing the circumstances in which they happened. Do you regret your actions? Do you regret advocating for these refugees for coming to our city for help? So, Checkers has been listening this whole time, mostly because he's been passed out on Mango (laughs) from this morning. But at the mention of, do you regret your actions? (laughs) Checkers pipes up and just says, no, of course not. We wouldn't have gotten to meet all of you if we had done things differently. While we may wish that a certain outcome did not happen, I believe that the choices we made leading up to it We could not have made any other choice than what we did. And there are people out there that we know that needed our help. There were refugees from an attack on a nearby town that needed somewhere to go, somewhere safe that they could recover. And so, really, like Sel said, coming up here talking with all of you was our only choice. We never would have turned away from that. And we also needed to fill why our friend the fortunate came with us and help their family, help them and the choices that they made to come with us. And Filigrin kind of just sits in the silence for a moment and just kind of looks at you all in turn and just kind of pauses and makes eye contact for a few seconds and then moves on to the next. They smile a little bit and... In as much of a sudden rush as someone of this person's obvious age can do anything, they put down their tea, which they have had exactly one small sip of, and start the process of standing back up. Well, that is all very interesting information and much to, to think about. Don't you agree, Juniper? And Juniper is, like, now looking at all of you. And there's, like, a pleading in his eyes. Can Val try to determine what they want? 24. Let Let me put it this way. Juniper looks like a desperate animal in a way. He wants a cathartic resolution and to know where you guys, how you guys feel about him. He would be just as happy with you saying you never want to see him again and understand that as much as anything else you could do. I think Val will rise from her chair and 
Filigrin's like making to leave, right? Yeah, it, it, very slowly in starting to shuffle out. Um, but again, it's taking roughly five minutes to do so. So plenty of time. <laughs> Filigrin, we have more to discuss, but I would just like it known that we will always do what we can to help those in need. And it's nice to know you have people like Juniper who do the same for their city and who helped us in turn. He looks over at his shoulder at you and kind of does that like old person pat on the, on the like bicep, tricep area. And he very sincerely says, I think you all have, have said more than enough. And he kind of just nods at you uh, knowingly. Val is not taking his brush off because she needs questions answered <laughs> from the council mm -hmm. and will not let Filigreen out of her sight until they are answered. Ooh, okay. So if he makes a move, she is following him. What okay, What questions do you we have? We need to know where the fuck Lorana is. She needs to know she can go research this word of power that the shepherd left before they leave. They need to know where the fuck they're going. Uh, okay. Val is pissed and she has questions and she is emotionally already done for the day. I and it am, is breakfast. So. I am distraught. <laughs> what? Okay. So, so he'll, he'll mm -hmm. still say like, you've said, thinking like, oh, mm -hmm. we have an understanding. I <laughs> get what you mean. And that's not. definitely not the Filigrin case. Filigrin has zero insight in this moment. Correct. Correct. <laughs> Failed you, the vibe check. Right. Exactly. And Kaskrin will kind of like take a look over at Checkers and like nod a little bit. And as the council member turns to address Val and just kind of gives her a pat on that shoulder, turns around to leave and hears Val kind of continue the conversation, he looks at the door to see a certain frog standing in front of it, just quietly closing the door <laughs> on him as the conversation continues. Now, Mr. Council Member, why don't we sit back down? <laughs> that was not threatening in <laughs> any way. Sophie was doing and, a lot and of yelling. And Catherine so. described it. Val was not. Uh, and do, do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Pines. I expect you to die. <laughs> <laughs> Have we also read the room wrong? Yes. <laughs> Am I going for it? Also, you know, yes. you, you you came in with this energy, yeah. Deepwood. Why not yeah, leave it? Yeah, right. Uh, Filigrin, like, looks around and just, like, takes it all in. And, like, his eyes then shoot open wide. He's like, oh, uh, oh, I, no, I, I'm sorry. I thought that that was the nice dramatic exit. Oh, no, we can answer any more questions. Please, let's just... And, oh, like... So, so I thought that this was going to lead to an actual, like, us having our time like in front of the council. Like a council meeting? Yeah. That, that's kind of what I thought this, this was going. Not that we would ask him all of our questions. Oh, I thought this was going to lead to uh, combat part two. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> this, is, this is where he rips off his mask as the shepherd again. If we just go back to the bounty house, I'm sure we'll get this all sorted out, right? <laughs> I legitimately was like, does Val in the middle of the night, just go and cry on the bouncy house <laughs> while sending a message to her mom and just like... You don't have enough third level spell slots. I did. I have one left. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah. I like crafted a message to her mom and everything and it was going to be like, she goes and sits and lays down on the bouncy <laughs> house to remember the fortunate just like fucking sinking into yep. it. <laughs> and like crying. <laughs> crying on the bouncy house. Head cannon for me, at least. All right, so I will. Um, I guess self, I'll, bring we'll, it back. Yeah, yeah. Bring we'll it we'll back, put it. We'll, we'll put it. In, we'll, we'll put this in. So, uh, self will, will kind of like you know stand back up and just say, um, "Would it be possible for us to get an audience with the council today, or or as soon as possible, to discuss the the reason we work here?" Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I um, I must have been too obtuse. Uh, no, we're, we're, I, we agree with you on the things. Did you not? We. This was for. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, that is, that is wonderful news. And I am, we are all glad to hear that uh, you will be accepting the refugees. Yes, right. No, this, 
I thought this was for Jun for Juniper. And like Juniper's just like staring and just <laughs> like fucking sanity has snapped <laughs> in this moment. That's, no, no, you uh, we wanted to, of course, hear from you and 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 uh, we can if it's important that uh, the ceremony and, and self will gesture to um to Val and just say there are other uh, questions that Oh my that god. We had. When I said you've said and did you I said you've said enough, but I thought that was like you made the move to leave Pilgrim, so we well, thought we were no longer uh, had access to the council to ask questions. No, well, no, and now oh, no I, one can ever leave. No, I thought, <laughs> wow, this mistake can never leave this I, room. <laughs> I made mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we have a uh, no. we have a habit of kidnapping people. No, no. <laughs> no. as Juniper can attest to. I, Phil Val just gets up and. Ushers Philcrin and Juniper to the door. It's like let's walk and talk. Yeah, shall I, I, we? Yeah, and 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 Philcrin is like, oh, oh my god, I am, I am so sorry. And it's like, but it's like walking, and it's like, but it's like, please, please, what can I? How can I help you? And I, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm here on the Val, Val will so return the the bicep pat to Philcrin and be like, I did appreciate your flair for drama. It's yeah, we. Uh, we try very hard. We have this reputation of being this ancient forest city. They want us. We're supposed to be wise and mysterious and, mm -hmm. and oh, oh no. <laughs> and it's just like walking off. And like Juniper is like fucking slumped and just <laughs> cannot believe what is happening. But like Filigrin ans like is happy to answer any questions that you have, and it does not have to just be Val who is asking these questions. Well, I, I think Val but, is actually trying to extricate I think, herself. Yeah. I think so anything she cast and checkers aren't oh. there. <laughs> so, uh, I think anything that we ask will actually end up coming through Val, but um, Selv will actually uh, if so. Is everybody leaving? Like you know, Checkers is opening the door. We are we are heading out. I'm assuming them. Val has to force her way through yeah. Checkers. Oh, okay. So, but we are. <laughs> no, I want him here. <laughs> I thought we were doing a thing. We're doing a thing. Cass said to do the thing. <laughs> he, gave, he gave the nudge, nudge, wink, wink. I don't understand. What's and Cass like got the oatmeal bar just like in his hand, ready to like start eating it and just spewing it. In faces. <laughs> so, um, if we are kind of like 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 headed out, uh, so yeah. And again, this is this is not to leave the city. This was just j like yeah. a fun walk and talk right, yes, of like yes. out in the I mean it's gross out and whatever and I'm imagining maybe like Juniper unfortunately has to hold as a giant umbrella. leaf like yeah, a giant like, leaf, yeah, yeah a giant leaf for everyone but it was literally just like oh, oh sure but no we can we can walk and I'll answer your questions it's it's fine I'm going to as we're walking I'm going to kind of walk next to Juniper and just say you did very well in greeting us outside the city have you considered being the representative for Deepwood that greets the refugees as they come in. Juniper, like, is surprised that you're talking to him. Kind of turns around and is um, just looks at you and he says, no, no, I, I, I guess I hadn't thought that far ahead. That's I think maybe I gave you guys the wrong impression. I'm like the lowest on the totem pole here. I'm very new. I've only had my wings for a little while. That means you do not have as many deep-seated traditional thoughts as a lot of the other members. Yeah, may maybe. Yeah, th thanks, Self. And as we're walking, Checkers will kind of <laughs> come up behind Juniper <laughs> and just put his arm around around him and just go, Juniper, I gotta tell you something. What you did back there was pretty messed up. And I know Cass is really mad with you, regardless of what he really looks like. But I think the best way to kind of smooth all this over would be for you to teach us how to ride one of those cool ravens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cass would love that. I'll tell you right now. He loves the sky. He loves flying. <laughs> loves to be off the loves ground. Loves to be off the ground as much as possible. And all of a sudden, you see the sky darken. <laughs> 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 the shadow of Kaskrin looms over both you and Juniper. I adore the idea that 
Val like was trying to power walk this old man out. <laughs> and like self comes up and it's like, hey, you know, let's do a little bit more kind of like glad handing. And then just everyone descends. <laughs> There's only so fast you can move with filigrin, unfortunately. Kaskrin puts one hand on Juniper's shoulder and is like, you did good. And then Kaskrin puts the other hand on Checker's shoulder <laughs> says, we need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> just imagining, too, it's like, and it's like, like Cash's rocky hand just getting <laughs> slowly tighter and tighter <laughs> on, on yep. Checker's tiny yep. shoulder. So you guys walk and talk. Questions are asked, and some of them are answered on your rainy, dreary, but elucidating walk. After a little while, Filigrin brings you back to the inn you guys have been staying at, and he and Juniper, who is looking in a little bit better spirits now, as they kind of drop you off, say, uh, please, um, I know that you must be on your way, but I and some of the other members of the council want to, to send you off appropriately. And Juniper steps forward, and from out of a backpack, they actually pull a second backpack that is identical to the one that they are wearing. It is pitch black, like supernaturally pitch black, where it almost seems like no light is escaping at all, other than there is some kind of gold embroidery of lots of kind of leaf and tree and nature patterns all over it. Juniper says all the, the Raven Mounts get one of these. It's a it's a, a backpack, one of the ones that one of the, the magical ones that you can um, store things in. It's uh, very handy. And um, there aren't as many Raven Mounts as there used to be. And uh, well, we had an extra, and we thought you all uh, could use it on your travels and could use it to uh, ensure that that your friend was able to be taken with you and travel safely. Eventually, you kind of make your way back to that same elevator area that you had risen up uh, just last night. Gathered there, kind of up on a, on a, a platform, is the entirety of the Deepwood Council of Elders. But there are also, it becomes clear to you as you are approaching, a lot of people in Deepwood. All the raven mounts seem to be there, and there are quite a few. You see there are ravens kind of circling all over, perched over very densely. Every, every rooftop is covered with uh, ravens, big and small. And there are... are regular people, uh, uh, some regular people who are here, and families and the old and the young and it seems like there's just a gathering of the city here. Juniper kind of comes out to meet you guys and, and nods and is looking a little bit better and they kind of like gesture you into the middle of this crowd. You see this Council of Elders, uh, some of them are, are seated. They are very old. But you see in the middle is is Filigree. He sees you guys come up and kind of raises a hand to the crowd who all kind of like erupt in this big cheer for you all. After it dies down, Filigree looks down at you all and says in this suddenly very supernaturally loud voice. I am Filigrin Pines, and today I serve as the single voice of the council. We, of course, must thank these members of the Golden Tree Adventuring Guild for their great services yesterday. For saving us and possibly all of Deepwood. These fellow mortals will always be known as heroes here. We, the Council, have also 
made an important decision. Long ago, this place served as a beacon of hope and of connection and of community, and we retreated from that in in shame, but also in fear. And starting today, we will not be afraid. We know now, thanks to these guilders, and he kind of looks down at Val for a second and says that we can't shut ourselves off to people who might bring us light and happiness. And we, of course, know that we can bring much light back to the world ourselves. In that moment, you see the giant mirror that is hundreds of feet up and back inside this tree that kind of served as this lighthouse. Just immediately brightens and shines. And that there is just this beautiful beam of light arcing out from Deepwood. Self will actually look at the beacon and just say, um, thousands of candles can be lit from a single candle and the life of the candle will not be shortened. Filigrin says, it is time for us to grow again. We must be there for each other and for the world again. And we must do the best that we can with what we know and what we believe. And we all have the golden tree to thank for reminding us of that lesson. You see Warren and Baltar are among the crowd, kind of step forward, and they shake your hands and, you know, kind of give you hugs. And Kaskrin, Warren looks at you kind of for a moment, and then as he shakes your hand, slips you a small piece of paper. As cheers ring out, you see four giant ravens swoop down and land in front of you all. You recognize one of them as Juniper stands kind of in front of you all, and three other raven mounds also step forward. Juniper, with a little bit of light back in their voice, says, Well, would you guys like to travel in style? And that is where we'll end this week's episode. Hooray! Hey! See you next week. Bye. 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 must say it does an old man good to see someone as young as yourself say to bring things back to the way they were that happens so infrequently as long as we don't say make deep wood great again <laughs> i'm just Never. i'm just thinking like okay boomer yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's a deep woods boomer <laughs> Okay, Bloomer. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Nice. That's good. Nice. Inspiration. Nice. Yeah. That was, uh, <laughs> beat me to that one. I'm so proud.